And of course, we milked by hand until I was 11 years old. Our first milking machine came at that time. We uh, gave names to all of our cows. Cows seemed to respond to the Pavlovian uh, discipline and are willing to enter the same stanchion once they've entered it a few times and will not touch the meal in another stanchion but enter the ones in which they should enter. The only time you have problems with a cow moving when you let them in the barn exactly where they should go is when it's a heifer that you're milking for the first time. You solve that problem by keeping the heifer outside until all the stanchions that are open are filled with meal placed there for them to eat and all the other cows take their place and then the one remaining, the new heifer, only has one to take a few times through that way and the heifer will always take the stanchion that is open <clears throat> and in the future always take that if all of them are open. So Pavlov seems to ring a bell doesn't he, with regard to the practices of farm animals. I'll tell you a story about one of our cows, uh, an end cow, and the cow was named Nub. But Nub didn't have the name to begin with. Nub didn't have a name at all. But my brother and I, milking by hand, especially in the summertime, while cows swap their flies continually, and if you're sitting next to the cow, that means every time the cow swings its tail, and in the summertime, because of the flies, that's going to be continuously, you're always being whipped side of the head with a cow's tail. So my brother and I, this is when we were about 9 and 11, the two of us, I being 9, we decided that we'd find some clippers and we would shave the cow's tail. That way, it'd be a little easier, we wouldn't be swatted so much. So we did that. Of course, that didn't improve the situation at all because now you have a long nub that is being swung and now it's schlocking you side of the head and there's no hair there to cushion it. But the most serious problem was as soon as my oldest brother, who in effect was the supervisor of the farm by World War II, he observed that we had taken away the cow's ability to swat flies from its sides and back which he considered a very serious offense, and of course, we were punished for that activity. You mustn't take from the animal what God has given it naturally in order to swat the flies. In the particular barn, there would be rows of stanchions on each side so that we could go up as high as, let's say, 20 out of cows to milk. Uh, it sloped to the center behind the cows, and of course, a drainage area moving out of the barn for urine. Right? So your stable was arranged in that fashion with the rears of the cows at, at each other. And in this particular barn, on a beam, my brother had placed an old radio, which was tuned in to, in the morning, the, supper or the breakfast frolic, and in the evening, the supper time frolic, which means you had two hours of country music from 6 to 8 in the morning and from 5 to 7 in the evening. And it was tied in so that if you turned on the lights in the barn, then, of course, the radio came on. So all of our cows during that time period had the benefit of the soothing music of people like Ray Roy Acoff and Ernie Tubb and T. Texas Tyler and other individuals of that, Reg Tex Ritter as well, during that time period, when they would all be popular stars also on what we call the Grand Ole Opry. So that was the particular setting for all of this. Uh, we milked in three-gallon pails and sat on milk stools, and it took about three to four minutes, four maximum if you're good at it, to milk a three-gallon pail of milk. Some cows gave more, some cows gave less than that amount. And, uh, of course, you had certain preferred cows, and you would squabble over who was able to milk which cow because some of the cow's teats were large, easy to melt, like squeezing a racquetball, whereas others, especially some of the new heifers, they were small and it's closer to milking a goat, which means it's only three fingers, it's harder to do the natural action of milking, and so it takes a little longer. So you fight over those kinds of things and who is able to milk which cow. But if you figure you're milking 16 cows and if you're averaging four minutes per cow and two are being milked at a time, well, that all worked very well, and it doesn't take too long to take care of the milking chores. When we move to machine milking, that is arranged so that a compressor 
is placed in the barn on a wall close to the cattle area, and that compressor creates suction. And from the compressor goes, at that time, let's say, not stainless steel, galvanized pipes, all well sealed together, and they run across the tops of the stanchions so that a jet sticks out between each two cows. And that jet has a turn on and a turn off. And if you turn it on, it sucks. And then you attach to that rubber tubes that go to a canister that holds about five gallons, and then also coming out of the canister, which seals at the top for the proper suction. You need the vacuum in order to do that. And then there are <clears throat> two tubes with four attachments for each of the four teats of a cow. So the canister setting in the middle, you can milk two cows at once. Normal milking, you would leave it on the cow for four minutes. And if there are two youth participating in this, then you merely switch between two cows and two cows, and at the same time, you milk one across the way or next door. That way, you are milking three cows with your brother, four cows at a time, and you've reduced the milking for 16 cows, and you can complete the task faster. A new cow, a new heifer, who has come in fresh, and that is the term for having had a calf, and in a certain period following that, good milk flows. And cows of that type, you integrate into the milking, and sometimes they do not like having the teats pulled. And there's a time of adjustment to where they are conditioned to this type of activity. When that uh, occurs to be the case, there are two things that you can do. There is a protector that will prevent a cow from kicking, and if a cow never seems to learn what it should learn and has a tendency to want to kick, and in kicking, all cows, animals, all animals that type, must bring the leg forward and push back. And so you have a chain with two clamps that fit right into the rear of the leg of the cow, this fashion, and you place that on the cow while you're milking. The cow cannot move its leg forward, hence cannot kick. And furthermore, the cow's weakest area in terms of using its legs is lifting it forward. And the truth is, a 10-year-old boy can stick his arm inside next to the udder, this leg, put it over on that leg, and a cow would never be able to kick or lift its foot and stick it in your milk pail because it does not have the power to break your arm moving the leg forward. The strength comes in that fashion. So those are some of the side problems that you sometimes face. My brother and I would try to finish the milking as soon as we could. In this barn, we also had, and this is the lower level of the barn, the up, upper level of the barn would be probably 40 feet high with hay mows and places to store your machinery and uh, grain that you might pour down a chute so they can use it to feed the cows. But in the lower level of the barn, at one end is where we kept the horses. We only had one left by the time I was 10 or 11 years old, but used to have four because of tractors. We didn't need the horses, but always kept one horse because it is very convenient in a small garden to maneuver a horse and do exactly what you want to do. It is very difficult to do that if you have a tractor. And nobody would want to spend the money on a tiny tractor just for a half-acre garden. So the horse is very, very useful if you retain one. And usually farmers in any given area, 10 miles in any direction, one farmer would have retained a horse, and that will be loaned back and forth here and there, just like you would loan uh, a stud bull for those purposes among the farmers. No pay or any money involved in that, just on loan for use for your gardens and special projects of that type. Then moving on down, there would be an alleyway in the barn where all the hay could be carried to feed the stanchions for horses or for the cows. And that would come down from a chute from the upper level of the barn. There was a small granary at the bottom where we retained the ground meal, ground corn and wheat that we fed the cows. That was their little tasty that they received each time they came in for milking, both morning and night. In the wintertime, later, we had pipes bring water so that there was a drinking fountain next between each two cows, and they quickly learned how to press the lever down with their nose to gain water, and you could keep a cow in a barn for literally two months without letting them out. The only complication about that 
is the cows have all of their residue for you to move and take care of. So it's much better to have milking in the summertime so you do not have extra stable work and the cleaning of stables to do with your five tine forks. Uh, in this granary that was close by where the feed was ground up above and it dropped through a chute, obviously that would attract mice. And we always had plenty of mice on the farm in all varieties of location. We're continually patching holes and plugging holes to try to keep them away from the corn and particularly the wheat and oats. But we had a cat, an excellent cat, a big tough cat named Tom, appropriate name. Kind of uh, orangish tiger stripes always on the wall waiting for us. And when we entered the barn to go to the granary, which had a sliding door, there was a light in the granary which was not on. And if you moved to the granary, Tom was waiting for you. The minute you walked in the barn, he was beside you all the way. And you walked appropriately to the granary first. And then when you were ready without turning on the light, because Tom didn't need it, you opened the door quickly and Tom shot through the door. And he would get one, sometimes two mice like that. By the time you could take one step in to pull the light on, he had them. So, and also we would accommodate Tom from time to time because when we were milking an end cow with the wall adjoining, uh, it was common for us to pull the teeth and shoot Tom in the mouth and he was waiting there expecting that. That's also something for which you can become punished uh, if you do that because it wastes the milk, as you know. It's not that you wouldn't give a cat milk, but uh, it's wasteful to shoot it like a fire hose to a cat sitting on the wall trying to catch the stream wherever it happens to go. But either way, it's fun. It's fun. And so that was the general milking process that would be carried out, and you could do four cows at a time if you had two young people. And of course, you have to have the strength to do it, and if you do it all the time, it is not difficult at all. Anybody could milk 10 cows a night, and it wouldn't be any problem at all. But if they didn't milk any cows for 10 years, and then tried to milk a cow with four minutes solid squeezing, they probably wouldn't be able to use their hands for three or four days, because the arms would be so sore. They weren't accustomed to that type of activity. So you can understand then that milking must be done twice a day at an appropriate time, unvaried. Uh, otherwise, the cow will start drying up and giving less milk. And when cows first adjust to the milking machine, if you were milking a cow and it was giving a full three-gallon pail in the evening, and then you found that you put the milking machine on the cow and you are only receiving maybe 90% of that milk. That's because the reticence and nervousness on the part of the cow caused the cow to not give down all of the milk. It is wise to put up with that, and over a two-week period, the cow will adjust, no longer worried about the sounds of any sounds, your compressor or attaching tubes or placing on the suction cups, and the cow will adjust to that and you must live with that for the shortage that you receive in a short time. When the cow is conditioned, it's all right. Some farmers made the false mistake, or false approach, and it was a mistake to do this, because they had been milking by hand when they chose to milk the cows with the machine. When the cow did not give all the milk down, they would then sit down and do what is called stripping the cow because by that time, after the warm milking machine has been on there and the cow has been milked for three minutes and you were through, then you would take two fingers and a thumb and pull down on the teats in this fashion and strip out what the cow hadn't given down to the milking machine. If you do that, the cow will become conditioned to that and in the future always save back 10% and you will always have to follow up the machine by stripping the cow. So you don't do that and you face the problem of a shortage for a week or two until the cow adjusts. Now a barn is a rather pleasant place, uh, particularly in the winter time, because about one end of the barn you have 40 or 50 sheep, uh, a stud bull somewhere, plus you have 16 cows that are in the barn or enter the barn or stay overnight in the barn in the winter time. And then you have a couple of horses and any other animals, two or three goats. That's a lot of heat that is generated. And so when you walk in a barn on a day that the temperature is zero in Michigan, 
uh, the first thing you take off is your heavy coat and you move down to a heavy flannel shirt, let's say, because there's enough heat generated in the lower half of the barn that you'll be quite comfortable doing your physical activities, pitching hay, whatever, cleaning stables, all of that, so long as you have the animals in the barn. So it's a benefit to that, and it's a place you can spend time without facing the severity of a Michigan winter. Now there's uh, one thing I would like to tell you, uh, several things I would like to tell you, and these are the kinds that I indicate create trauma for youth, especially when you experience it for the first time. After that time, you become callous, and uh, it doesn't disturb you and bother you in any particular way. The first one involves ringing hogs. And when you ring hogs, you are actually placing metal rings in the nose of the hog. The only one that isn't circular in a simple fashion like that, and it would be shaped like a C that almost comes together of solid metal with sharp points on either one that slide past each other, and you place it in something that looks like pliers, but when open, there's a place to place the ring. When closed, the ring will close that far, just like pliers, and you need to put those in the snout of the hog. And another type is like a wire loop, heavy wire, with points on the end that are not closed, it goes into the nostrils on the inside, comes out in this fashion, and then is bent up and around. That means it will catch on anything and any hog that is rooting, any rings around the top of the snout or in the center of the nostril, will irritate the hog and will cause them to stop rooting because hogs will root and they will destroy and destroy and destroy. And if it's a warm spring and you have lawns and there's a thaw and the ground that has been covered with snow is now juicy and wet and if hogs root under a fence, which they will in any fence that goes into the ground four inches and moves along, if it's a wire fence and the hog is not ring, doesn't have rings, then the hog will continue to root in the dirt until it lifts up the fence and will go out and hogs are always looking for something to root in. So if you have a nice lawn, and this happened when I was about nine, uh, hogs got out, and as a result, 10 or 12 hogs just ch turned an entire front lawn into just mounds of, like, moist knots of grass and soil. So the whole lawn had to be packed down again, rolled with a heavy roller again and again, so that the grass would come up and it would be level enough so that you could mow. So hogs can cause a lot of problems. Now back to the ringing of the hogs and how important this is. This is one of the first things that delivered trauma to me and I think I was probably four or five the first time I was close to an operation of this type. What you need is four very husky farmers and then one of them is carrying a heavy wooden gate, small gate, and four husky farmers will crowd a hog in a hog barn into a corner and then with four leaning on that hog so it can't move because a hog can be three, four hundred pounds, then my father would slip a knout over the snout and it was a pipe about four feet long with a cable or else grade eight malleable wire attached to the handle and then the two strands of wire went down and created a loop on the outside at the other open end of the pipe. If you pull on the handle this way, the knout closes, the loop closes, just like a hangman's noose, very tightly. But you need large grade wire or cable to make certain that you don't injure the hog by cutting the flesh. Though you're going to cut the flesh when you bring the hog, obviously. So then the house, hog is crowded into a corner, use all the force that you can to hold the hog there, and my father would slip the tool over, jerk it up so the hog's nose was taut and tight in that fashion, and then with his plier type apparatus, place rings one, two, three, four around the top of the snout, of course the hog is bleeding now, and then place one right in the center in the nostril area. During all of this time, of course, where you're holding the hog and while you're ringing the hog, there is constant shrill squealing going on from a full-grown hog. And it is very loud and it is very disturbing. And when you're around that, when you're four, you seek to leave. By the time you're 16, you'll be putting the rings in or else helping hold the hog. 
But either way, it's something that must be done. But I remember on the first occasion for me, I didn't enjoy being close to this operation when I observed it at all because I just was just so disturbed by the loud squealing of the animal during this particular operation. But it's important and it must be done. And of course, hogs are very, very important to all farmers, not only for sale, but for many of the meat products that they will use. And most farmers on a farm of our size, 200 acres, milking 16 cows, a family Six children, eight in the total family, obviously would butcher no less than two large hogs a year and prepare all the meat, whether in jars, in sausage, however you prepare it, through the winter to be used in that fashion. So, number one disturbing development, uh, the ringing of hogs. That could disturb a youth on a farm. The second one, and this was done regularly, but I just wasn't involved to participate in it until I was in the third grade. My brother was then in the fifth grade, went to a one-room country school, and one morning in the spring, my father, rather than my older brother or someone else, said, both of you come with me. We have to cut the lambs this morning. Okay. So he went out, and this is at 8 o'clock in the morning, and we, go to, we have to be in school by 9, three-quarters of a mile away. And my brother's job was to chase the new lambs that were male and catch them in this barn where they're confined, and then bring them to my father. It was my job to hold the two hind legs of the lamb with the frontus <clears throat> of the lamb facing out. And at that point, my father, with a very sharp jackknife, which he always kept in his pocket, would grab the scrotum of the lamb, pull it out, hack off the bottom half. Then with two fingers and a thumb, rip the testicles from the lamb, throw them aside, I would drop the lamb, it would run away, bailing, eh, be gone, and the operation is over. So if you are going to school in the morning, and right after breakfast you are treated to the castration of about 20 lambs, all of which you would like to have as pets, and sometimes when a sheep would have two of them, we would take one of them, put it behind the stove when it was newly born, because sometimes the sheep would reject the second one and only feed one. We would take that lamb, place it behind the stove, and take a large glass bottle, put one of those special nipples on it that's about this long, about as big as my thumb, and we would feed the lamb milk regularly each morning till the lamb was old enough to chew on grass and cook milk. So we always, almost every spring, you had one lamb that was a pet, but you enjoyed lambs. And so the idea of being involved in that operation when I was in the third grade, when I went to school that day, I didn't have much appetite for lunch. I felt kind of stunned just a little bit because of the experience. Later, you adjust to all that type of thing as you do to any number of other farm operations. And it's not shocking to you at all. It's just the routine situation. It comes with the territory. You adjust. <clears throat> Third item I would like to tell you about that creates trauma to some degree is when an animal is seriously injured. And you must immediately eliminate the animal and have something done in the way of rendering as soon as you possibly can. This happened when I was 10. And uh, cows were coming in. This was wintertime, so it was dark outside. The cows were coming in, and one of the new heifers slipped on the slanted concrete that led down to the drain and broke her leg. Rear leg, rear right leg. Fell, got up, started walking, but my brother, oldest brother, who was about 24 or 5, was in the barn, realized what had happened. Bone was sticking through the leg about 12 inches up. Blood was beginning to run from the jagged bone protruding. The cow would walk on it and then be squeamish, but went right to the stanchion. And my brother immediately yelled to me and said, go to the house immediately and bring me the 2520, which was his deer hunting rifle, which I did immediately. Came back with the rifle the cow being locked into the stanchion so it couldn't back up, but continually being fidgety, trying to stand on the leg, not knowing why the pain was there. My brother walked around right in front of the area where you feed it, and with the barrel of the rifle no more than four feet away, shot the cow immediately right between the eyes. It dropped. 
the same time, we'd only had a phone for about two years on a party line of four. A call was made, the emergency call, that you would call to whatever area, uh, whatever person in your area was available to be contacted for emergency rendering. So in a very short time, a truck was there, chain was put on the cow, it was hauled out, slid up into a truck, and was off seven miles away to a locker and butchery in Athens, Michigan, and all was taken care of. You don't pay a fee for the services. You merely share the meat with whoever picked up the cow. You may be able to receive half the meat. The other remainder is payment for those who furnish the service and the locker that took care of it. But that is a rather stunning thing for a young person to hand a rifle to their older brother and have him at point blank drop a cow like that. You become callous. You adjust to those things. By the time I was 11 or 12, I was permitted to shoot the hogs that we were butchering. All I had to do was, when you slop the hogs, bring the feed there, you say, it's that one. Oh, it's that one? Okay. All right. 22 rifle would stun them enough to drop, and then the butcher would immediately stick them and cut the proper arteries here, and the hog would lose blood immediately out in the yard, usually in the snow because you butchered in the wintertime, but you could drop the hog with a 22 long rifle, and you could shoot it from three feet away while I was eating. That didn't bother me at all. By the time I was 11 and 12, my mother would permit me to take the 22 rifle, which I was permitted to use as long as I used proper care and understood all the rules. Otherwise, you can't use the rifle at all. And I would be able to use the rifle, and she would determine and tell me in the chicken yard exactly which chicken she wanted to use for Sunday dinner. And all I had to do was walk out and wait, lean against the tree, aim, shoot the chicken right through the eye, then pick up the chicken. My mother would then chop off its head and proceed then to the hot water and removing all the feathers. So the use of weapons properly used, and that was always available to anybody on a farm, and no one would bother at all about selling me a box of 50 long rifle bullets when I was 11 or 12 years old. They only cost 25 cents. Nobody would think anything about that at all as long as you were trained. Weapons are in one place and never come out unless there's a purpose. And if they do come out, you indicate where you're going, how you're going to use them. And it wasn't unusual that uh, on a fall afternoon where the weather is very nice during the Indian summertime, and if you're hunting on private property, either your own or those of neighbors who can use your property as well for hunting, and that's all understood among neighboring farmers, long as they know you, I could wander through the forest and choose. And on a Sunday afternoon, nice weather, sit by a tree in the right place and maybe pick off two squirrels and bring them back, toss them on a newspaper on the floor, and my mother immediately knew she was going to skin two squirrels and whatever our dinner was going to be that evening, there would be roasted squirrel would be part of the menu. The same thing was true with rabbits handled in the same fashion. But there's involves some instruction here in the use of guns, the cleaning of guns, the loading and unloading of guns, and it's all understood. You don't have the privilege unless you do it correctly, and it must be done in that fashion. I have not owned a weapon personally in my entire life. These were all farm weapons, and uh, I don't have any inclination to want to purchase one now because I don't have the opportunity to use it. But I would own one if for hunting purposes. But instruction in weaponry is very, very important. Now, a fourth topic that does involve an activity that can create trauma for a young person on a farm. And I observed this firsthand. But I, did, I had never observed it before. I probably was nine years old at the time. Now, what you must understand about both horses, cows, calves, and some other animals, not so much with the sheep, is that when an animal is short of water and they are extremely thirsty, they will drink more than they should too rapidly. And if that happens, and it isn't just water that can cause a problem for an animal, but if it happens with the water, 
and it's an extremely hot day, so if it's 95 in southern Michigan and the cows have been in the field all day and there's have no access to water in these particular fields where they're grazing and the grass is reasonably dry because it's now July, and you bring the cows up, you have a large tank that probably holds 2,000 gallons there, but 15, 20 cows can lower that tank by two-thirds in a very short time, and they must not be allowed to do that if it's a hot day and they have been without water since they left in the morning to go back to the fields and graze after milking. So what you must do is allow cows up, keep your eyes out, must know your cows, and if you allow a cow up and it starts a drinking, then chase it away. Then allow others up, chase it away. Don't allow any cow to drink very much except over a period. You might spend 20 min minutes there chasing a cow away, then letting cows drink some, then chase them away, let them drink some more so that they do not have such a rapid intake of the water so it cannot create gas and cause bloating of the cow. <clears throat> when, the animal becomes, when an animal becomes bloated, they lose their ambulatory movements. Uh, they soon are not able to stand. They fall. They can't bring their legs together. Now they point out in these directions, as you've seen, a dead animal that is bloated after death. That is what will happen to the cow or calves or anything else. So you have to be very, very careful about that. Now, in, uh, out of our back door of our farmhouse was the chicken yard, which led to the chicken coops. And then three buildings, a garage, where all sorts of equipment was kept, and then the next building was a hog barn. Behind the garage was an area enclosed about a third of an acre, which was dirt because it's where hogs roamed all the time and rooted. And so that dirt area was a hog pen, and they could come in to be fed and go out, whatever. But when summer comes and it's very hot, you must do something to accommodate sows or hogs because they don't sweat, so they do not have the same cooling system that a human being might have. And because they don't sweat, uh, they have to cool themselves in some way. And the ideal thing is for them to lay in mud, which they thoroughly enjoy doing. And if it doesn't rain and you do not have adequate water holes that can be turned into mud by the rooting and rolling and wallowing of the hogs, you must supply the water especially if it's hot. You don't have to do it, and they don't need that if it's not hot. So in this particular hog yard, <clears throat> had plenty of hogs out there. We now had running water, and we received running water when I was seven years old. That means a pump in your cellar tied to a well that will bring water into the house so that you could have it in more than one room, and also outside have a spigot in the front and the back of the house for a hose. Prior to that time, you had the pump in the kitchen that had to be primed, and then you had a windmill outside where you could carry buckets of water of one kind or another. Put the big wash tub on the kitchen floor, take a bath in the wintertime, do it in the backyard in the summertime. But that was the situation at that time. But by seven, we had running water. So I'm about 10 years old, nine or 10 years old. We have running water, and my father had told me in the morning to run a hose out to the hog yard and just let it run until all the indentations and other areas in the yard along a particular fence and behind the garage filled up with water, went down, filled up with more water. That way it'll become mushy and there'll be plenty of depth and moisture. The hogs will then quickly turn them into wallowing holes and be satisfied and it's good for the health of the hog and the security of the hog to have that wallowing ability. But if you have plenty of water out there and there are some water holes that the cows are not using, then they fill up with water and you have standing water, don't you? Now away from this particular hog yard, a lane led past our orchards where our plum and apple trees were located and then opened into a five acre grazing field which was used and available to the hogs. And sometimes we segregated calves that were hmm, one third grown now on their way to being heifers, right? And we would segregate those calves and not have them with the rest of the cows. And you often do that when you wean them, although there are instruments that you can use for a calf that does not want to wean. As a result, you tie this, it's like a hood that you put on the head, they can see, but it comes across the nose of the calf and then has loops out here and it prevents the calf from getting its face underneath a cow so that it can suck. 
And it's called simply a wiener, metal wiener. You chain it on. But you segregate the calves sometimes. And so in that five-acre area where the calves could graze, there were five or six calves, and they were grazing there. And we had cut off that area as it came up the lane by putting some two-by-fours across from the wire, one wire fence to the other in a lane that was probably 10 feet wide. Well, the calves came up. It was extremely hot in the 90s in July in Michigan. And uh, the calves came up and started nudging around, and they knocked one of the two-by-fours down. And as a result, they were able to step over. And then they moved on into the hog yard. And what do they find there? Why? Some large holes that are filled with water. It's very hot. The calves are very thirsty, aren't they? And so the calves move in and start to drink. One came first, two or three a little later, so they wouldn't be able to have as much water. And the first one that came in commenced to drink. I thought nothing of it. I wasn't aware of these circumstances particularly. My father steps out the back door and shouts, remove that calf. Get rid of that calf. Get the calf away from that water. So I ran out and chased the calf away from the water, but the calf stumbled, walked a little ways, stumbled a bit, and then collapsed with both legs out. The calf had immediately become bloated with gas because of the large intake of cool water on a hot day after being without water for some time. So when that happened to the calf, I yelled to my father, and of course he observed that too. Father went back in the house and immediately comes out with his trusty jackknife. Now we have a calf that is, let's say, third grown animal, not a little calf. Funny weight here, 250 pounds of it. And the legs are pointing out like this as it lays on its side, frothing, because its respiratory system is failing because of the pressure and the buildup and the bloating. And my father stoops down next to the calf, counts ribs. I don't remember how many ribs. I didn't even understand what he was doing, but he counted ribs. When he reached the right rib, took his jackknife, went and jabbed it in about four inches. At that time, just like deflating a tire, terrible odor gas just flowed out, and the bloating went down, and the calf collapsed to its normal size. Laid there for a few minutes, there was just a very modest amount of blood by the wound, and the calf then, my father kicked it a few times, the calf helped it get up, the calf stumbled a little bit, got its ambulatory security again, and we chased it and it trotted off down the lane back to the field. Two weeks later, you wouldn't be able to find the wound, and the calf was fine. Now what my father had done, or he had learned, I did not know that, that you must count the ribs so you know where you can puncture reach the area where the gas is contained, immediate stomach, for the immediate intake, without damaging any vital organs of the calf. That's what he understood. How an individual who went only to the seventh grade knows all of these things, well, it's part of growing up in a farm environment. And I assume he had known it, learned it from his father, and his father would have known that too. So I observed that for the first time, but it was rather shocking to have him pull out a sharp jackknife and stab a calf. And then I learned what had to be done. And not wanting to experience that again, of course, you were very, very careful about the intake of animals in that fashion. Now, it isn't just water that could cause something like this or produce this reaction in an animal. Because animals will struggle, as you know, and animals will die if they are tied in any way or their legs bound and are confined. And that's all very severe. I observed that personally one time when a very heavy gate blew off in a windstorm and fell on a sheep. We did not know it had happened, but it happened at night. We did not go to that area, maybe for a day or two. And there we found that the sheep, in struggling to get out from under the heavy gate, had shoved one leg in between two slats, another leg in between the others, could barely move. But what did the sheep do? The sheep continued to struggle to get free, to work so hard that it consumed its bodily fluids and frothed at the mouth until the fluids of the body of the sheep were reduced so much 
that the sheep died, just like a human being would in a water shortage. And you know how important water is as opposed to food in surviving under adverse circumstances. So an animal will cont continue to struggle. So that's why you have to be very careful. That's why for a bloated animal, you must do something immediately because they will struggle and they will lose despite the gas and the moisture they've taken in. Their respiratory system will be affected by the pressures and they will froth at the mouth too. Now, a little aftermath of all of that. What I just described to you probably happened in 1944. In the 1960s, long after I had gone through high school, undergraduate school, and on to university for a PhD, and then had come to Arizona State University to teach, we went to see, my wife and I, a movie, a very excellent movie, called Far From the Madding Crowd, and it's based on a novel of the same name by Thomas Hardy, written about 1870 in England, and it's about provincial and rural life of the squirearchy of England during that time period. And when we went to the movie, while observing the movie, Alan Bates, the actor Alan Bates, is a drover. He herds sheep. That is, he's a sheep husbandman in British parlance. And so that is his job. And he hires on with Bathsheba Everdeen, a character in the novel, played by Julie Christie. He has to take care of the sheep. Now, sheep have to be confined to certain areas and you move them here and there and you have to understand that sheep eat things very close so you do not want them to ruin the grass by eating it too close so you want to move them from time to time. But back to our point of what causes gas in an animal's stomach and the same condition could be generated by something very green, extremely rich like fresh clover in unlimited amounts especially for sheep that have been moved from here and there and, and nibbling standard grass that never gets any taller than that. If they move it down to that level, you move them on to some other place. So there's a scene in this film in which the sheep break through a fence and flow out into this gorgeous field of green clover about this deep. And it's a crisis. And Alan Bates, my wife really didn't understand why that would be a crisis, she didn't ask at the time, I'm just observing. And Alan Bates immediately is out there, and now you have sheep that are falling. They have become bloated. The gas is building. And Alan Bates immediately comes forward with a tool to try to save as many of the sheep as he can before they die because of respiratory failure. And he has a tool that looks similar, only you have a handle instead of the dial at the top that would tell you the heat. You have a handle instead, but it'd be twice the size of, but shaped the same way as that large stainless steel thermometer that you put into a turkey to see when the inside meat is done. It's shaped exactly that way. And Alan Bates, belt, he knew exactly what my father knew. He knew exactly where that should go, not to injure vital organ organs, but to release excessive gas buildup from the sheep. And so he took it this way. The sheep is prostrate. It's not fighting him in any way. It's not like ringing hogs, right? Holds it this way and plunges it down. It probably would go in at least that far. Psst. Now, the whole aim for Alan Bates was, can he perform that for enough sheep? If you've got 150 of them in that condition, you're going to lose a lot of them because you can't let the gas out soon enough. My wife's question immediately was, what is he doing at which time I had to say, well, I will, uh, I will tell you later. It's a little bit long to explain right now. But while driving home, we talked about my father and his jackknife and the bloated calf. So, all practical things. It doesn't seem startling at all later. But the first time you face it, it seems a little bit on the startling side. Well, I'd like to lighten this up a little bit now and talk about other aspects of rural and farm life at that time in which youth can become involved, and many times it's fun and you have practical benefits from them. Much of it is the blessings that nature has offered for you, being the types of trees that you might have your farm, or other aspects of that type. I'm speaking from the wide variety, anything from apples from which you make cider uh, to maples for syrup or to walnut trees, trees you would have on your farm. We had 
two large black cherry trees, one red cherry tree, eight plum trees of different types, 15 apple trees, and across the field south of our barn, a 20-acre field, there were 12 dividing the fields up, half the field, 12 walnut trees plus walnuts growing in any number of areas. Right, the elms were for shade or for elevating heavy things off, off their big rims, limbs. But for the most part, you could benefit from these trees and their uses. First, walnuts. Black walnuts we are talking about now. They come each year. And uh, what, when they are green, they have a shell on them that is soft. And you want that at the time in which you can take the shell off, the shell starts to dry. It's hard to remove that outer shell around it, just like you have a peeling on an orange. Then you have the hard walnut in the center. And of course, at the time that the outside is green or starting to turn a little bit to a rusty color, that's the time when you want to knock them down from the tree or pick up those that have already fallen. And you put them in burlap bags and you bring them up close to your house or by the barn. And then you stomp on them to crush off the outer layer, which is about this thick. Walnut, the stain from that outer layer is so grand and is so effective. I don't know if it's ever been used for artistic work or for coloring anything in history. I've never read that. But when you shuck walnuts and you have this yellowish stain on your hands, it will last for four months. And anyone would know within the last four months, you've shucked walnuts. It's just impossible to remove them. And it will soak through gloves. Wait. So you collect the walnuts in that fashion, you place them on a cement floor, and you stomp on them. Then you sweep up all the hulls or shells, outer shells, coverings that you have, toss those away. They taste terrible. There's a terrible taste to them. You know if you touch your finger to your mouth after handling those, how bitter that particular flavor is, just as anybody who works in a produce department of a supermarket, whoever handles an artichoke with his hands and then mistakenly says, oh, I have a problem here. He realizes there's a bitterness in his mouth that will be there for an hour. Artichoke and okra, very, very bitter. Now you have the inside of the walnut, or what you see in a store that would be hard and black. After it's dried, it will be black. It still has a kind of golden, greenish color to it. Then you pick up all of those. You take them to the same place you might store your popcorn on the ear, tied together by the husks hanging over beams, and you find a flat place up in the attic. Be very dry, no moisture can reach there, and you spread the walnuts in one layer out so that you have maybe 400 walnuts spread out in that fashion. All of these, of course, come free. You didn't have to pick them. The walnut trees would have been there anyway. They would furnish shade in the summertime, but you take advantage of that. But it wasn't anything I ever saw my father or older brothers do. It was something that my brother and I, close together, as you would automatically do, because it was kind of a project. It was kind of fun to do that, because someday you're going to be able to crack them and eat the walnuts, and your mother will use them for all sorts of baking. Then you leave them, and six months later, they have turned black, and in the cold of winter, because you can rotate these through and have some here, some there, and know exactly when collected. Then, in the cold of winter, when you couldn't do any work outside uh, on any particular day, except your chores that you would do in the, brown, in the barn, but the temperature plus the depth of the snow would really keep you inside between certain outdoor activities in the barn. At that point, my father had a large portion of a tree trunk that stood about two and a half feet tall. And attached to that was a shoe horse that you could use when your heel came loose on your shoe. You could put new nails in your heel and repair your boots or your shoes one way or another on this, but a very large and hard chunk of elm. And so there's all of this large, it was this big around, and so the shoehorn comes right out of the center, which he's attached to the center. So you have all this large, hard, wooden area around it. And so to help my mother out, my father would sit quietly, listening to the radio, other things, we had a radio in the kitchen always, right in the center of the top of our Crossley refrigerator. And my father would take a hammer, hack away, had a pick, and he would work on those hard black walnuts, sometimes for two and a half hours at a time, collecting them. 
collecting the meats so that my mother would have them for baking. We didn't just eat them, collect them for baking. So you had a source of nourishment. It all comes free, and you don't have to cultivate it. You don't have to water it. All you have to do is collect it, and it's a little bit fun to go through that project. So my brother and I took care of our walnut supply each year in that fashion. What was more fun for us, and we hit upon this purely by accident, nobody trained us to do this. We learned it from other youth, and we weren't asked to do this by our parents. But everyone knows that the probably the most delicious thing that you could place on pancakes would be natural maple syrup. It has a nice sweet flavor, and it's totally natural. It's not processed sugar. And uh, when I was about seven or eight, my brother, almost two years older than me, we were walking across a one-mile section from a friend's house through the snow because we had had... Uh, we had had a thaw, and then we had had snow, and it returned cold again. And here, hanging on a tree, was a half a gallon bucket nailed to the tree. And then we noticed a little spigot coming out of the tree that was made of metal. So what is this for? Well, our friend says, oh, they're tapping the tree to get the sap out. I said, what do you mean the sap out of the tree? Oh, take the sap out of the tree and boil it down. And you can make maple syrup, and that's the only operation to it. You just boil it down to the consistency you want, and there's nothing chemical or anything else to process it. That's all you have to do. So, frozen in this pail, half-gallon pail, was about that much ice. It's really sap from a maple tree. We brought it home. My mother put it in a pan for us on the stove. We had a wooden cook stove. It was always on. The fire never went out in that stove, even in the summertime. And, of course, room for four different areas to cook on top, plus an oven and an upper area that would stay warm as well. So on this wood cook stove, my mother placed it and just kept it warm. You don't have to boil it now. Steam can come off, but we're not talking about bubbling. Gradually, it reduces and reduces. And actually, this much in a half-gallon pail only made us about one tablespoon of maple syrup. But either way, my brother and I were able to taste it, and it was kind of fun. So then uh, we talked to others and realized that we could tap trees ourselves. And we had a maple tree in the front yard. We had one behind the house. We had two in the barnyard. And uh, on my uncle's property, directly across the road, if you just crossed an eight-acre field, he had a row of ten maples right there before it led to a swamp, right where he had his windmill for his sheep, to bring water for his sheep. So my brother and I experimented, and we asked other youth how you do all of this. And we found out that there was a plant, which we had known about for some time. It's called an elderberry, and it grew around our one-room country schoolyard, lots of them. And we used to take uh, the elderberry branches, maybe four and a half feet long when we were very small, tie a string around, take all the branches off, take off the top, right, where the berries would be, and then tie a string around the top of it and hop along on an elderberry stick, pretending it was a horse and that we were somebody like Tom Mix or Roy Rogers. But elderberry stalks are segmented joints like bamboo. And there is a joint about every eight or nine inches depending how big it is, how big around it is. They grow about this big around. I never saw any bigger around than this, mostly about the size of my thumb. Now, if you take, and <clears throat> we had done this trying to make whistles. If you take and cut it between the joints, evenly so you don't crush it, then you look at the end and you realize that half the size of the normal pencil you would pick up, or let's say three times the size of, of the lead in a lead pencil, there is a pith running up the center of the stalk. And if you take a heavy grade, grade number 10 wire that's very large, and you jab it into the end and you keep pressing, you can run the wire through it and it will shove the pith out the other end and it will drop. It is kind of soft and looks like the color of cottage cheese, but it's dry. So you shove it out. Now you have something you can look through with a hole in it the size of grade 10 wire. Then you take 
and cut into half of it out this way, so now you have something like a trough that you're looking at, but this remains solid. Then you go to the garage, you find your father's brace and his bits, the kind that work this way, and you select maybe four sizes so you can cover and match the size, the circumference of the elderberry branch, the one that is not troughed, but the other end. And when you match the right bit to the end of that, and it is spring, and things are starting to thaw, and trees freeze solid, then you go to the south side of a maple tree. You take the brace and bit. Once you've matched it to the right side, you drill into the tree. About that far. That's far enough. Then, because you've chosen the right side, size, the spigot that you have made out of an elderberry branch will fit tightly so that you will not lose sap running down the tree. That's why you must choose well. And the outer epidermal layer of the elderberry is reasonably soft, like a soft beige or tan bark. And so you want to have to force it in so that you seal the hole, and therefore any sap that flows from the tree will have to throw through the hole at the other end, and you can see it coming out immediately if the thaw is there. You can see it come out and it'll start dripping down. Then you hammer a ten-penny nail into the tree just above that, take a three-gallon milk pail, hook it on the nail, and all the sap will pour into the three-gallon milk pail. Which means you must collect regularly, and sometimes the whole pail will fill up in 24 hours. Sometimes it takes almost two days to fill up the pail. But now you're going to have 10 or 12 pails out there, aren't you? And that means you may sometimes may go in the morning, sometimes in the evening after school, but in the spring you will be collecting pails and bringing them back each day. You need a large tub in which to pour this, and then this meant that my mother had to move pans all the time, and she had dish pans that would hold the equivalent of five gallons, four to five gallons. She would have those on the stove, and you would pour the sap into them, and they would be on the stove, on the hottest part of the stove, then they moved over to a part where you would want to simmer, where my mother cooked supper on the top of the stove here, and then they would be moved back. <clears throat> you left them on there overnight. Steam is coming up day after day, and when it moves down to where a whole dishpan has nothing but that much in the bottom, you pour it into a mason jar, set the pan back, pour more sap in. Now, over a period of about three weeks, the first time my brother and I did this, we made 32 and a half quarts of maple syrup. So you can imagine if we are reducing a whole multi-gallon dishpan to this much, maybe a half a quart or a third of a quart, you can imagine how much sap we had to carry. But we did, and now you have 32 and a half quarts of wonderful maple syrup in your mason jars, stored in the proper place, and you also have enough that you can take care of your Aunt Annie and take a couple of jars to her and Uncle Charlie, and your Uncle Joe and his wife Annie, you can take a couple of jars to them too. It's a nice gift that you can give someone. Interesting thing about it, as I think back on all of this, was this was a lot of fun. And it wasn't an assignment, it wasn't a chore. We never would have had to do it. But by discovering how much fun it was to make our own spigots, get the brace and bit, and tap into the trees, and then have the syrup made, uh, if the syrup had been purchased, I don't know what the difference would have been. But uh, it was very beneficial, and it was an enjoyable experiment for us, and we continued to do it as long as we were able to do it and had that option to do it. Now, in the area where I live, there were large sections and sometimes whole forests of 5 to 12 acres that were only, or let's say, 95% maple trees. And in the center of a forest like that, the farmer who owned that land, it wouldn't be un unlikely for him, and quite often they did, would build a cabin in the center with some giant stoves and have all the equipment that they needed for boiling down sap, and they might tap 250 trees and be carrying it every day. But those individuals, of course, supplied someone and sold it, and that was part of the income for the farm, just like selling milk would be part of the income for the farm. If you have a stand of maple trees of that type, 
they are, and you use them that way, so have a cabin there so you can boil down the syrup in that location, that would be called by a Michigan farmer a sugar bush. And I know someone right now who built a house in the center of what was a sugar bush on the edge of Fulton, Michigan. And when someone, when you asked, when I asked, where does so-and-so live now? They said, oh, he built a house in the sugar bush. And you would know immediately what they're talking about. It's a stand of maples that would be used in that fashion. There was a stand of about 12 acres, uh, two and a half miles from our house. And the Weimer family owned it, and they also used it. For, now, today, I don't know if commercially they're doing that anymore. But I do know one of the favorite gifts that my oldest brother, or next to the oldest brother, chooses sometimes to bring us when he comes to visit in Arizona from Michigan is usually a half gallon of maple syrup, fresh made from a local farmer, or he will choose to bring two half gallon jars, he has done it with whole gallon jars, of the popcorn that he grows himself. That is very, very good. And so those are all the things that come natural, and the maple syrup, syrup just seems to be an absolute bonus that you can benefit. The other item, of course, is uh, the apples for cider. And my mother canned apples as she canned pears. She might can 80 jars of apples uh, a year. And, but we also ate apples fresh, uh, put them in the cellar, and they would last a long time, just like the potatoes, as long as you have them at a temperature that's about 52, 53 degrees, and they're going to remain at that. <clears throat> and then my mother also would uh, tell us when to take the pickup truck, my oldest brother and I, this is before I drove, and uh, we would collect all the apples that had fallen to the ground and any that she no longer wanted for canning, and we would collect together the apples in burlap bags. We called them gunny sacks. And maybe have two-thirds of the pickup filled with 12, 13 bags of that type and go to a cider mill. Also, which was an operation that did not furnish a living for anyone, but at the time that I was growing up, there were two locations in which farmers on their property still maintained the crude traditional cider mill, which in the fall they would open up for a two or three week period and everybody knew that they could go and for a small fee have all of those apples crushed into cider which is done with a series of screens and burlap and they're just crushed and the cider pours out. You take along 10 gallon milk cans so if you took a pickup truck and eight or ten bags of apples you might come home with one and a half ten gallon cans of pure cider and then of course you proceeded to try to drink it up before it turned hard. And uh, you really only have about 10 days and it starts getting a little bit bitter. The most common use for cider of that type was when the Farm Bureau was thro throwing <clears throat> a special shindig, a barn dance, uh, especially the uh, young members of the Farm Bureau, right, those under age 30, something, and we're having a barn dance of one kind or another, or you're having a special picnic in the fall, a wiener rose connected with the Farm Bureau, and that's when many farmers might make their contribution to the large potluck gathering, a 10-gallon can of fresh cider. And you would make certain if the affair was going to occur on a Saturday afternoon, you would have it crushed on a Saturday morning and would alert the individual who had his cider mill that early so that you could have the cider as fresh as possible. It's one of the pristine, wonderful drinks that you can find as a youth on a farm. But it also is something that can be dangerous to your system if you haven't been having it regularly and you find yourself in the morning drinking two large glasses at breakfast and then you come in from work in the middle of the day and have a glass and then you have in the afternoon and then you come in from the chores at night and have two more glasses. You can find that if you have 12 glasses of cider in a single day and you're not accustomed to it, it can definitely have an effect upon your system. But either way, it's one more bonus that comes with that kind of rural life <clears throat> and very, very beneficial. That's all that I think I will talk about today. And uh, in the near future, we will talk one more time about some other topics that affected farm life or the interesting aspects of farm life. Thank you.